All right, that says live. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Conspiracy Horseman Infidels. That's right. Your second ultra kayfabe declassified transmission of the day and possibly the biggest one we've ever done here. So hear me now, Spectrum Cable. Your internet better be on time this time because we're in the moment. We're live here today and you're going to let the man go through because it's Hacker Hameen, the master. He bows before him. Sifu, TJ, Jagadowski. Yolo. Ha, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, so so pumped right now. Uh, every time That's I how you it, bring a show in right there, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, at IO, that's we got to get the the crowd hyped. So <laughs> right. a little bit of that, I, I throw it in there, man. But uh, well, I've never seen long form improv before. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I try and come in hot, man, and uh, shake them out of their boots a little bit because some of them are in the cubicle right now, and you know maybe their boss is walking by and they just need a, a little raz to. to be <laughs> that, so, uh, but I appreciate you guys know the face, man. Especially if you're one of our subscribers, you're obviously probably a wrestling fan, and uh, you've heard me talk about this guy plenty of times throughout the years uh, on my platform. And, and you've seen him at every commercial break on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. It's uh, TJ Jagodowski, uh, Sonic spokesperson, one of the world's greatest improvisers, and uh, one of my early coaches, a, a guy I, I look up to to this day. So welcome, TJ. Thanks, pal. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you, man. And it was good to see you just recently in New York. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so all over the place with uh, doing indie shows or doing this stuff. And it just lined up right that we could escape for a weekend. And I really needed to recharge my batteries. And seeing you and Dave perform always does that. And uh, it was just uh, really cool to be to be out there uh, again. And so I, we were down Soho, yeah, and that way. Uh, that yeah, way. it was good seeing you and your lovely bride, too. Hey, you know, the hot ladies who watch us know that you're taken, right? That's that's. Uh... <laughs> well, they know I have 432 wives. That's right. I'm always looking for another one. <laughs> I always meet the same one. <laughs> <laughs> and your lovely wife, too, Beth, another huge inspiration early on in my career. I would watch. Uh, her in Dual Exhaust, uh, which was two-person improv on, uh, uh, you know, the kind of the mid-card level where you and Dave were the the top-tier main eventers doing it. And it well, just was awesome I, days, man. They owned Cage Match for a yeah. long time, man. Like, they might have ran for a year taking down everybody who stepped to them. But they were, they were, they were tough, tough. That's how you make your name in the territory. They did it, man, and it's time to right. improve, and, and they did, and it was just a, a, a great thing. So early on, uh, you know, I, I always let Beth know what uh, an inspirational performer she was for me, another just classic, strong Chicago woman in, in the uh, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, Katie Rich, uh, you know, that whole stream of uh, women that have come out of there who are just unbelievable home run hitter performers. Yeah, come up on the mean streets of West Dallas, Wisconsin, that lady did, you know. <laughs> Stone throw from the uh, Olympic skating training facility in, uh, in Milwaukee. Used to, park, used, to, used to park cars for the Wisconsin State Fair in their front lawn for, you know, five, ten bucks a head, which she got the pocket as a kid. Man, tough days, those <laughs> early days. <laughs> Going in her act, in her car, man. But I was so glad when uh, – you know, you guys uh, joined Union and then collided in, in the crazy improv world, dude. That's just two unbelievable forces. And I think creatively there's something down the road that will come out of that that's even uh, more wonderful. So I, I look forward to that. Now, now we live here in the Polish Palace, the Plywood <laughs> Polish Palace, pal. Maluski and Jagodowski. We'll put down the pierogies and uh, pick up the plywood. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, man, the the crazy thing for me, obviously, you know, and uh, I, I left uh, Chicago to go pursue wrestling, and it was so uh, just the next level of what I was trying to do and and bring to that. And then as I settle in, here you are, man. My life crosses, and you're just on Sonic commercials, and I'm just like, yes, because the people who don't know and and wouldn't know you from our you know, inner improv circles where you are a, a top guy there are going to know you in the mass, you know, obviously commercial world of it. But here I am getting to sit there and, and just see, like, I know the level that this guy plays at. And Peter Gross, too. I'm not trying to take any away from his performance. Really? Yeah. Awesome. I just, I just like, finally, somebody, it's not, you know, <laughs> we're not doing a Scorsese film, which obviously no. you guys could be, but I'm like, they're getting the payday. 
they're they they don't have to worry about scrapping. It just makes me feel so happy for you guys to be like, all right, dude, we've got another iconic thing that is just in place for us now. And, and it's been nonstop changing. Every time you see it, it's it's something new every week. I love it. We've been crazy, crazy lucky pops. I think we started doing it in 02. So mm -hmm. 17 years on the same campaign. There was one year where they switched ad agencies where we were kind of out. But so 16 and 17 years, we've had a job that doesn't ask a lot of us, really. You know, we, we work honestly a dozen days a year, maybe maybe yeah. 10 days a year, do a bunch of them at one time. And, and especially early on, they let us improvise the hell out of those things. So there also wasn't anybody telling us, you know, like obviously there were language restrictions, but hey, you can't do this. You can't say that. You know, they were they were real wide open and uh, a very game to say like, hey, well, let's see what happens. If people dig it, we'll keep on doing it. If they don't, then, you know, like what the hell we try and, you know, we'll, we'll shut it down. But so far, um, you know, it's kept going. They, they just changed ad agencies this year for now for the second time. So this will be the third different agency. So we'll see how much longer, you know, how much longer they decide oh, to keep oh. us around because yeah, when a new one comes in, they want one thing on it. You, you, know? let, you let them try something and I'll unleash the wrestling world on all of them, brother. I will unleash. <laughs> they gotta take down the <laughs> they, that'll be the worst boardroom decision they could ever even try and make. Not, not happening. <laughs> not happening, man. You're on some Colonel Sanders stuff now, my man. That's just how it is. I, I, I love it that it's, the second city, 30 second blackout. I love that. It's a character I've seen you play. It's your go-to. It's it's what you're really, at, the heart of what you are as a performer, the innocence, the playfulness, it shines through. So you can always have a little fun twist to drive home the, you know, Abbott and Costello screws to, to Pete on something as he's trying to outwit you, right? And I, and I can be as dumb as I am naturally. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to pretend to play at the top of any intelligence anymore. And be my naturally dopey self, you know. That's great, man. <laughs> and uh, I just saw the one with the smashed up car for the new Butterburger. Oh so yeah, too, dude. That was very good. So these guys, there's there should be one coming up. I, I if if they end up running it, where they brought in a serious ass monster truck, dude, like a nice twenty foot high monster truck. Had to go in underneath, like the body, like you can't go <laughs> into the door. You climb in underneath, and if this thing goes on, it was. You know, and they're showing it for all the three seconds too. Like they bring in this enormous monster truck. Yeah. You can't drive there. They got to tow it in in bits. Like basically put it together all for the like to look one minute where I'm looking out the window. Like, hey man, where do I park this? You know, like <laughs> then they you know, take it down, put it on a truck, and drive it out of there. It's the, the size and scope of this thing where it's gotten to from where it started is is crazy. Oh man, that is awesome. I can't wait. How could they not do it? If they're spending the budget on that, we got to right, get it. Hopefully it's uh, maybe even safe for, you know, a big event, Super Bowl, something like that, or even uh, along those lines. What's it like, uh, you know, being outside of the improv circle with the marks? I mean, you get plenty of marks in improv, but, you know, just uh, as, as we call them in the Conspiracy Horsemen, probably most of Beth's neighbors growing up, the Nancy Browns of Wisconsin, who are just like, oh, my daughter's a cheerleader. And I'll, like when they are you out there at Starbucks or, you know, uh, coffee and getting coffee now and you get a lot of that of people saying Sonic Eye? Not too, too much. Um, every every once in a while, like walking around downtown, if Pete and I are ever together, you know, if we're like <laughs> on a shoot and just wandering around, then yeah. like we also tend to like walk. I always tend to walk on basically like the passenger side of him too. <laughs> so it's like we're lining up on purpose in the most recognizable way possible. Is it in contract if you guys walk together, you have to have like a Sonic drink or yeah. something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to walk with a console in between us with, a, with cups in it. Yeah. Um, but every so often, thankfully, like usually people are pretty nice about it. I think the people who probably hate the commercials just don't, you know, quietly say like, oh, fuck that guy. What, you know, like, <laughs> I, so, so it's usually the nice people or the people who dig it who will come up. And often it's like, it's like secondhand where they, they won't be the ones who really like it. It'll be like, oh, my mom loves these. Or like, <laughs> my husband really likes these commercials. It's not them. It's like, Oh, my kids love these. And I've always like, well, thank your kids for me or thank your mom for like, <laughs> um, so here, here and there, but not, but not too, too, not too, too much.
Well, I'm, I'm sure it will expand, man. You're just a part of the, in the wrestling world. That's the thing. If you guys really wanted to get over and you want to talk to Sonic and do something, <laughs> you should know that like the, the wrestling demographic is so die hard and bitter at the same time. <laughs> it doesn't like 20 years from now, if the commercial is off, like we look back now and we'll remember the karate fighters commercials, karate fighters from when we used to watch Raw sure. when it first started. So know that in the wrestling lexicon, you guys are in there. You're just that's a part of our backdrop cool. for the last five or six years. So that's why. I mean, you guys did stuff at Raw, right? You did. You did the Sonic thing there. That Sonic was at Raw. Where, didn't you guys go or no? Man, I. I thought you guys did something unless it was pre-taped that that wasn't. It might have been pre-taped, but I used to drink pretty heavy too, Ben. <laughs> I, I, I used to, and I still do. <laughs> Definitely a few places that I don't necessarily remember being. Uh, yeah. But it's it's one thing like you mentioned of like you know being recognized or whatever. Like I'm really about as famous as I want to be, and right. maybe even like a little less would be good. Uh, just a, qu a question for you: like how if you could own the world? Would you or would you lose the like the conspiracy horseman aspect of of your of your world? You know, if like if you were recognized on every street corner of every every city in, in the, the country, of the world, do you would you want that? Could you handle it or would you rather like have, you know, be known in your corner of it? Yeah. Well, here's the situation. Um, <laughs> uh, that, uh, that's great. And, you know, the, there's the megalomaniac part of me that, uh, of all the performers and, and what we strive for in approval. And this is going to sound super conceited, but there's a reason why I had the nickname Pops at a young age as well. Um, uh -huh. I feel like I can shoulder a lot. My father is that. My father puts on all that woodsman stuff that you know about. And yep. it's at WrestleMania with 35,000 people, and he's the top guy. So I've just seen how to manage people, how to avoid bullshit, and how to get the best out of performers. And yeah. I I never consider myself a performer with the it factor, like you or uh, a, a Pete Shukoff from uh, Epic Grab Battles would have yeah. that. I, you know, so like – I'm always, I feel like I'm a workhorse and there's plenty to do for the workhorse. Not that you don't work hard, but you guys just have. Right. You're okay. way more of a, you're way more of a showman than I am. You got way more. <laughs> hit. Got more <laughs> I have to hide behind facial hair and flags. Yeah, no, you like I'm Johnny Appleface. You, you're like. <laughs> but to, to answer your question, I feel like I would be able to, because I, if I got to that point, I would still speak the truth that I need to, to wake up people because I feel like that's my mission of let me pull down some bullshit for you and shine some light on something genuine. And okay. we all move forward together and all these lines, whether it's race, religion, whatever, da, 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 is nothing more than a separation. If we all like smoking weed and watching trailer park boys and we're on all, both sides, then by all yeah. means, if laughter is in the middle where we all meet, then let's use that and expand from there. So uh, you know, and, and wrestling is that too. You know world, That's the only thing that crosses you know the world, countries, man, is wrestling. It crosses everywhere in the world. You know where the world meets, dude? Jerry Jones' luxury luxury suites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, like everyone's meeting in Jerry Jones' luxury box <laughs> in, <laughs> in Jerry world. That's what I'm saying, man. And maybe uh, after you guys get all your uh, living stipend uh, in Chicago, we can all do that. We'll all just get boxes at uh, – yeah. I don't know if you know this about me. If I ever told you about, I came to wrestling through my grandfather. My grandfather was the World War II vet. Loved, loved wrestling. So I, I grew up watching when like Hogan still wore the black trunks, and yeah. you know, and, and uh, uh, so you were, watching, you were watching Vern Gagne AWA. Even though you you're a Massachusetts guy too, though you know, mm -hmm. so you're a East guy. You're yeah, Syracuse. But the dudes I loved like as a kid were like Kumala the Ugandan giant. The Butcher, um, you know, uh, Ricky the Dragon. I loved, oh, it was uh, not Jumping Jim Brunzel, but um, I mean, to, remember Tony Gurria? Oh, yeah, sure. Great agent, that's too. Man. All the time. Yeah, and, and, and that, that's that's and a guy who can get a good match out of anybody, right? That's a, that's a guy who you want to work with your stars because you know, make them look like stars. Okay. And did he tag with Quick Draw Rick McGraw? <sighs> 
I, I, I'm sure you might have. That's a tough one for me right there to pull that out of my okay. mind. Uh, I got too much CTE. It was, it was like just wearing plain trunks and stuff. It was before like the uh, like the uh, um the British Bulldogs and you know and uh when Adrian. guys looked like they looked like the beer city brawlers of Wisconsin with the beer <laughs> bellies, and then body guys on gas, you know, came into the into the scene, whether it was Tony Atlas or uh -huh. Super Billy Graham, you know, like you can't really look at Dad Bod compared to those dudes right? <laughs> that muscle beat shit. But uh, but there's guys like Dusty Rhodes who uh -huh. had huge charisma to get over and. Again, if you see if everybody's a super jacked guy, now the dad bod guy sits out a little bit different, right? Doesn't he? Okay. And you mentioned Kamala and Abdullah right there. I don't know if you've seen my other tag partner, Congo Kong, but he's kind of oh. the modern, he's the modern day, you know, uh that. And I'm I'm not Abdullah gigging myself, but I'm the sheik, right. you know, to some degree. <laughs> so it's it's just the next level, especially with Islamophobia, whatever we've done yeah. in wars and and Kong we're a throwback to the eighties while everybody else looks like a little gymnast, uh, you know, sports boy. Now yeah. put it in there with the, with these two crazy, big, ugly son of a bitches. And you got something that's new. That's old, you know, or old. Yeah. Old. Like Nikolai Volkov and the iron Sheik, And yeah. Well, they missed the boat on that. Cause they've got a guy now Rusev who they claim is Bulgarian, but they brought him in just like Rocky four. If he okay. dies, he dies all the shit. Right. And they blew their wad on social media because wrestling isn't taking care of their business outside of the ring, TJ. Like, we make a contract with the audience that you're going to suspend disbelief. And even in the social media world, we have to take care of our business. They're not at all. So nobody believes they're Russians anymore. And that really hurt them. Okay. And uh, instead of, of in a time of Putin and Trump where you've got it all right there with yeah. life imitating art, they didn't do shit with it, dude. So it didn't, I didn't know, you know, the Iron Sheep was like Fred Smith or whatever until like three years ago. <laughs> oh well, no, that's 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 the Sheik uh, from uh, Michigan. That's Sabu's dad. The Iron Sheik was actually from Iran and was part of the president's uh, royal guard and was okay. One of the no, okay, right? gotcha. Yeah. But he's a he's a drunk crackhead now. So gotcha. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Ivan Polish Power Putski was real big with my grandfather too. Oh, forget about it, dude! How Remember many, how many roaring, grandpa? how many roaring double hammers did you lay down in the living room? <laughs> 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 That's awesome, dude! Yeah, I actually got to work a uh, show with his uh, grandson as well, man. Is that um, right? Grandson now, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 Scott. Well, uh, I, Ivan, Ivan uh, Polish Power wasn't all that young when I was watching him either. He was, no. he was yeah. But that's the era. That's the difference of it was men in the ring. Now you have a lot of guys who look like they're kids who work at the mall, dude. Yeah. Like tw you're, you're going to have your blue chippers, but they just created this NXT facility. Well, you know, when I left, I went to OVW in Louisville when I left okay. Chicago, when I left you guys. And then, <laughs> which was the Harvard of, prof it's the IO of professional wrestling. It's the second city. John Cena, Brock Lesnar, Batista, Big Show, Mark. Oh, wow. You can go on and on and on uh, of the biggest stars came out of there. And then when I was there, Triple H and Shawn Michaels showed up with Steve Kern and took pictures of the place 360. And they, and because they're like, they wanted to open a, another Southern one. They had one DSW that failed uh during wow. south wrestling and then they right. opened four. A lot of twos now <laughs> yeah so <laughs> yeah, that'd be great for for discounted, discounted yeah. they, re, they, they, they got out of the game and then the shoe game was the way to go oh, well, great. <laughs> so they opened uh florida championship wrestling uh, a, a complete identical thing to ovw and they pulled their contract with ovw and then FCW died because of wrestling politics and became NXT, which is now their feeder brand in-house to make these factory wrestlers that are all NCAA athletes. Jeez. And they just, it's a lot, it's a $40 million a year loss just to make athletes. They have 300 people under contract who aren't TV ready to do that. Ima imagine Charna at IO signing everybody who is on a team and, and that's it. Yeah. What you do. Mouth. Everybody, man, wheels within wheels. Yeah, dude. this is. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing, and I, 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 you switched to wrestling. I was gonna try and keep it in, probably. It, uh, heat's on you. <laughs> uh, we can go wherever you want, pal. Uh, and uh, I want to get all your stuff in, man. I appreciate you giving me the time. Uh, but the, here's the thing: they've done this factory 
uh, creation, creator wrestler where uh, there's forms you learn and whatnot, but they're promos where when you watched it and when I loved it, you watch Roddy Piper. That's He knows his business and the rest is all off the head and he's going to yeah. take you on the roller coaster. Now yeah, yeah. it's a formatted promo on how to read a script. TJ, you can even hear him do the page breaks on TV. Like really? they're, they're one step away from a teleprompter. So they have no true improvisation skills. And you know, that's what I wanted to do, man. And I got sucked into it in a different way. And the politics in my mouth might have cost me a couple shots. <laughs> but uh it's it's all because I say the truth. And I'm only, I'm not hoping for their failure, but I see what they're going on and I say, dude, here's TJ, here's Dave, here's IO, here's me, here's all these people who could come in as coaches and just give them that each week and they should be performing as team ensembles and should be doing character monologues and all that. But nobody there in WWE can step up and say, this is what we need to implement because our product is hurting because we have this factory system and we've just made factory performers. And now you have a stale show that went from a 6.0 rating when it was organic with real people who knew their business, top performers down to the ones that emulate that we're at a 2.0 rating, dude, you've lost. Do you think is the performer not being not knowing or being comfortable enough in their character to be able just to speak like expositionally from from that character's point of view? Or is it from the top down of like, this is a package product. This is exactly what we say. This is where the page break happens. And that's how how you're going to that's this. Or is it, uh, you know, like the, the performer himself, like. Ra- Ra- Rowdy Rowdy was that guy. You could say like, "Hey, Rowdy, what's your opinion on you know patio furniture?" And he'd have one because he knew that he knew that person really, you know, knew that that persona really well. Um, so, where do you think it's coming from, the the top or the performer? Yeah, it's changed because I do a podcast with Vince Russo, and when his writing partner was Ed Ferrara, who I did Late Night Late Show with with Jordan when we were right uh-huh. there, uh, and that's right when I left for Chicago or when I left for Louisville. So it was just those two guys and Vince McMahon when they were doing the rock stone cold, triple H, the biggest draws ever. Right. Right. Now there's 27 writers. There's seven guys who are the ex biggest stooges in wrestling who will run to Vince to get their own business. Everyone's cordoned off into their own little teams. So you have people who don't even know the continuity and flow of the show who might be broken up into team one. You go shoot that. You go shoot this. So our interweaving line is already screwed up vision wise. You know, we're not going to have that to be able to come back and button it all up nicely at the end where we've taken them on the ride together because everyone's doing independent stuff and then they're all fighting for their own business and then if it's something bad or politics happens they're gonna make a choice to bury somebody by overexposing them or making a rib out of something and they're not good enough performers on the fly to get something out of it to get themselves forward so now you're burning your audience and they're just with you and now they're do- coming back every week just to judge how bad it can be compared to how we used to love it Gotcha. It's very strange. Uh, It's like bruise touching. Plus they put things like um, the noble edge effect with philanthropy efforts where they're doing stuff with Connor's cure or whatever, make a wish kids. Gotcha. But that becomes more important than what to feed their audience of, of keeping those numbers up, man. So, okay. But hey, not everybody even needed it before, you know, Alpha and Sika just needed those eyes. That's all they needed. Eat some raw chicken and you're over, brother. That's it. Yeah. George <laughs> Animal Steel, the word on the turnbuckle with a green with a green tongue. And you don't need you don't need too many words, you know. Well, let me talk about tag teams here, man, because we talked about your tag partner Peter uh, Gross in uh, the Sonic mm-hmm. commercials, but you're a tag team specialist, bro. Because uh, you know when it comes to really making your legacy, it's all for me. It's you and it's TJ and Dave. It's Dave Pasquazi, TJ Jagodowski. Uh, you know, I mean, the book is right here, you guys. Uh, hey, look at that! Yeah, right, improvisation <laughs> at the speed of life. You can catch Dave Pasquazi on uh, Lodge Forty Nine or on Veep. Yeah. Uh, and, and you guys, I've, I've, I, I was so privileged to sit in Improv Olympic, in the heart of it, at the most pure, crazy pagan time, and uh, and be able to sit there probably for the first one hundred shows. I don't think I missed any of them. Uh, and That's see the work there, pops. 
Yeah, <laughs> I was there, man. Uh, I, I almost fucked up pulling lights one night when I was asked to. I had still haunts me, things like that. <laughs> That's the worst job, dude. <laughs> pulling lights is the worst. You can only make a good show bad. Yeah, Noah, Noah was standing there looking at me like he's like pulling, pulling. I was like, no, nah, dude, they, they wanted to fight warm. I was like, oh, oh, yeah. dude, that was pressure. I, I, like, I, hey, like I'm doing this movie called Wizard of Oz. You want to you mind pulling lights for it? You're just like, don't look at the man. And you just pull it right there. Like, <laughs> just like, oh, man, I don't know what to do. I felt like it was over. <laughs> <laughs> my monkey came in and flew away i thought that was the yeah. end man. i don't know where we get home does she live there now did she get a condo a nice condo in the emerald i don't know <laughs> <laughs> titanic at the boat down no redemption just <laughs> <laughs> the iceberg man. i like yeah. this to be a thing i'm not i don't want to see it hit the iceberg we're just gonna take it <laughs> awesome um, but yeah, man, uh, that, you know, went from, and, and it was crazy cause I didn't mind paying whatever I pay in New York there, 30, $40 a ticket, but I saw those yeah. shows for $5. I feel like I need to pay Pat some money, dude. Like I owe you, <laughs> <laughs> like I stole from you, but, uh, you know, these shows were just, suck, dude, we didn't want, we didn't want people asking for money back. We figured at five bucks, at least like if it stunk, they wouldn't come, <laughs> come with pitchforks and torches saying we want our scratch back. Well, they pack the motherfucker out every night after the first two, man. I'll tell you what, because, and I'm talking, you know, overbooking the room set for 200 with 315 people, hottest nights uh, that it could be, and everyone loving it for an hour of two man improvisation that was better than anything you were seeing on in movies, on TV. It was Sopranos level stuff from the masters who were set in a bar there. And, uh, you know, you changed a lot of people's lives with that, whether you guys realize it or not, to, to influence performers. And then when I was just in New York, after being out of the improv scene, to sit back and watch <laughs> the marks. Wild, dude. Yeah, to sit back and watch the marks be like, oh, somebody walks in like, I heard he got out on that team. I'm like, in my mind, I would have been that person back in the day. I'm, I'm like, fuck that team. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like it matters, dude. I'm like, where's my, where's my envelope, dude? I got to pull 12 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so then uh, earlier in that day, and this just speaks to, you know, and uh, you're going to have to take it of, of how over you guys are. Uh, you know, I was I was down on Broadway and I, and I walked past uh, Frankie and Johnny. I saw Michael Shannon. I go, man, it'd be cool if he was walking my wife. I go, it'd be cool if he was walking in right now. I just want to tell him I appreciate him, you know, that uh, I've learned a lot just by watching him. So we're sitting there and uh, Tr Tracy Letts walks in. I'm like, oh, cool, man. I didn't know he was in town. You know, I was, I'd seen plenty of those when you were out or something. I was like, yeah, he's that guy's pretty over, Rach. And, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then fucking Michael Shannon walks in and sits down four seats away from the wife. And I was just like, okay, all right, here we are. Like just manifesting things, just group mind, just in the place, in the zone, in the Dell mindset. It, it just, things like that fuck with me being an atheist sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> we, we're, we're one of the only people who do a show where the audience is way more talented than no, than the they're not. Stage. See, that but dude, that night is like Mike Shannon and Tracy Letts, or like Amy Sedaris, Timmy Meadows, you know, like are, are in the house, and those are the people. Like, um, I mean, Dave, Dave was a little bit be before me, so people like Amy and um, uh, like Paul Danello and Colbert grew up in ways watching Dave, you know, like. But for me, the people who were watching Dave were the people that I was watching and like thought it was, you know, they were on, there was watching, watching like Colbert and Carell. That's the first show I saw at Second City was Col Colbert, Carell, I think Canelo. It was right after I believe Amy Sedaris left. And so these are the people that are unfucking touchable. And then on a night, in you know in soho or whatever they're, they're in our they're in our fucking audience like it's a it's a trip dude a real trip well that's know? the thing and i know how humble and like i say you've got the the maternal side that shines through but i'm telling you right now i see an, almost michael shannon's whole lexicon and that's where you and you have to be humble as actors but you and dave are better you and dave are better than everyone on the planet no freaking way yeah, you are dude you, <laughs> you absolutely are but you, what's his name that retired? Uh, Bill the Butcher, uh, shit, from Gangs of New York. Uh, oh, Daniel Day. Uh, I mean, he got out of the game, and you guys became number one and two. And, no and way. 
brother, and you know this, you got to give me this at any given minute, anywhere in the world, the, the person who's improvising best is the person who's in that moment the the best you know like and that goes probably that probably goes for a lot of stuff it goes for sports i'm sure it goes for aspects of of wrestling whoever's in that moment yeah that's true true. you know like and and it doesn't matter about you like your 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 level it's just your connection to that second and being in reaction as opposed to enforcing your will on something but just reading it as it comes and 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 truly like i i appreciate the comment and i think dave and i are pretty pretty good at it but there are whoever, you know, whoever's living it in that second is the best, is the best going. And that might be some kid in Des Moines right now who's 17 years old, but is actually like in the fucking moment and, you know, and doing it, doing it right. Yeah, whatever, dude. Don't try and put yourself over on me. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you, might, you might get over on that other shit, but I'm a worker now, dude. I'm a disgruntled dude. And I'm telling you, man, uh, I, I lays it out. I see so much shitty performance every week. So when I see something and you do have a point because Killer Cross, who is uh, an unbelievable performer uh came on the scene this year and did exactly that what you explained but at the same time if i got my roster to build and i got john cena and the rock available to me i'm taking john cena yeah. and the rock and, <laughs> and that's you and dave so the the that, that's just how i book it man um is is this cross kid the last one who's kind of come out of nowhere for you who just like you're like wow is that well we're we're in the era of these teenagers who do all these acrobatics and it's like synchronized swimming killer cross comes out he looks like a like he should be opposite the rock he should be a heel uh opposite okay. the rock in, in movies uh he his stuff is just his promos are so believable he protected all his business he he did like a who done it thing where he left a trail of bodies his stuff is on some real next level, uh, you know, um, it, it's Batman level type stuff. That's that's where he's at. Well, everybody else is, is uh, you know, doing kindergarten stuff pretty much. So okay. he's, he can stand out, but they fucked him everybody on money. Knows it. Well, the thing is, they fucked him on money in the promotion that he came in. When I worked for Impact, I had to, you know, threaten to sue them too. They've been through four iterations of people buying out the company and it's always the same thing kind of bubble gum and tape holding it together but because they're on tv they have credibility so they owe this guy x amount and he's their top star and they want to pay him nickels and dimes not paying what they even owe him so online everybody knows this and now he's putting that over because he wants to make his celebrity rise which he will but he sacrificed the the like psychopath part of his character but dude i mean he should be Van Dam blood sport when they when they remake all that stuff he should be a top guy dude. he's but he's above wow. wrestling that's how good his talent is yeah. wow um, Thank you for yeah, yeah for sure man killer cross is over dude and I, I gotta say that so he doesn't rip my head off if we get in the ring <laughs> <laughs> um this is, yeah, all just ass covering. this is all ass covering <laughs> uh, uh he'll actually enjoy the hell out of this just a highly educated guy who would be phenomenal at what we do uh, I love right. smart people, man. I love yeah. smart people. Um, and, and uh, you're, you're dealing with one of the smartest right now, and it's not me. It's Rush Howell. I used to watch hey. that. I used to watch that guy from the sidelines and knew he was in with the biggest part of the clique. You know, his brain power is intimidating, dude. Like that. It's, like just it's a mega trap, man. Mega trap. Whatever you know, like those yeah. Ghostbusters, so, when the Ghostbusters open shit up and, and goes, you know, like ectoplasm dudes would just be so that's what his brain's like. It just opens up and take the fucking world in if it wants to. Yeah. And uh, highly educated from kind of that, not, I won't say elite, but, you know, upper elite Atlanta family style. So he's got mm-hmm. this. 80s um man i'm gonna i'm botching uh names tonight uh he played every dick in the 80s and now he's on the blacklist uh he was also on the office yes uh uh, you know like that's rush like walking into the room not that he's a dick like that but that aura of dude you just from central casting pluck him and put him in that role he's gonna murder it every time he could do that with no problem but the high level yeah and like uh, and no one knows how like kind of sweet he is, you right. know, like it's because he, he's, he's such, he's a, he's a, he's a good fella. And it, that's, it's almost more fun when you get, when you get the spader read and then realize like, Oh, that dude's actually pretty, pretty tender. When you're, 
<laughs> when you find out. Well, the- it's like Spader at the talk shows now is just like, oh man, I like to walk around and you know, I'm a new sweater, you know. <laughs> well, the thing is, the biggest heels in wrestling are always the nicest guys. And, is that right? So it seems like now that I've listened to here's a situation so much. I've really gotten a, a new appreciation for Rush. I especially enjoyed when you guys were talking about his love for board games and then the board game that he made. Oh. Uh, and and he was like putting it over where you're not embarrassed, but he he was selling it. And like that was just a genuine thing where he was nervous and he and that, that, his love and his passion and his nerddom for it was coming out. And I was really like captivated in the moment for that, man. And that was outside of the show completely. He's um so he's our he's our he's my DM mm-hmm. for my like the three year Dungeons and Dragons campaign that mm-hmm. I've been involved involved with. I'm a dwarven cleric, uh, nice. swing a pretty mean battle axe or a uh, warhammer. Dude. Uh, but Rush is our Rush is our DM. You don't. Get um, it. he sets up like tremendous. Oops. Oh, sorry. Make him fall. Uh, I've been I'm in 3D printing for my buddy Sal, my co-host. So I got all these D and D. Man, yeah, like uh, so I, I'm hooked on 3D printing. Sorry, go ahead, continue with D and D. He's he sets up like tremendous scavenger hunts for his <sighs> for his friends. And I think this might have come up in the podcast that he just like is a great table setter for other people to have to have fun. You know, mm-hmm. like he doesn't mind running it, which is the job nobody wants. No one wants to be the like the the boss of this of the scavenger hunt everyone wants to be hunting you know like you don't want to be the one who buried the treasure you want to be the one who finds it mm-hmm. you know and he's really good at allowing other people other people to do that and I, oddly enough i think like when we would watch him improvise and be like this dude's brain is other fucking worldly he could in the first scene of a 45 minute show come up with an improvised board game the rules for it where everybody was on the board and when they went back to it for a second beat 35 minutes later, know where everyone was, remember the rules to it and have, you know, like have, you know, how the game has progressed to that, to that point. It's, it, it's other, it's otherworldly. And I'm sure it's what makes him a great lawyer and what makes him great at putting together like puzzles and hunts and riddles and all of that, all of that stuff. It, it yeah. is. And like you said, for him to say like, Hey, a third rail of a relationship would be a woman saying like, you can't you can't play games anymore. You'd be like, all right, sorry, you gotta you gotta go. I like boy. And 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 it's just brilliant, man. And to watch him with all that, knowing that too, I would watch him from you know, whether he was up with Carl in the passions, I'd be like, I like wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just feel so small sometimes. You're <laughs> like, oh shit, I've got so much work to do on myself. <laughs> You've done it. You've done all that work. Dude. Oh, thank you, man. I'm still chipping away, dude. Uh, down 45 pounds. I know Rush was saying that he wants to lose some weight too. I, I can send him my buddy Stevie Richards' uh, fitness program. It's just a resistance band program where you can buy the bands cheap and do it at home if he wants to. So please what let him know. Uh, Stevie Richards, my co Stevie Richards, who was in WWE and everything for a lot of years. It's just resistance band program. I've been doing that cardio at the gym i'm down 45 pounds so i feel 45 yeah How i got another feeling? uh good i got another 25 to go because i'm trying to make a play to get on nwa they just relaunched that from atlanta and i don't want to be like let me send you something where i look half sloppy and and i not I have a shot, right so when that and that's good something i kind of want to talk about too man is um chicago and i see this now that i said you froze Sorry, for yeah, one sec, Ben. Would you say, say it Okay, cool. Thanks. Good. Good, yeah, good good timeout call, coach. That was a good one. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I see, you know, the archetypes of Chicago where I was the Chris Farley, you got to be the fat, funny guy, or you got to be the skinny, nerdy guy, or you got to be the woe is me girl, or you got to be the empowered intergender, you know, like uh, all of these different things where – I think people would be able to get over more if they just took, uh, and it took me 20 years to accept this and being like, Hey, if I want to get on camera in Hollywood, I got to incorporate diet and working out every day into my, not to say that, you know, whether it's Mike and Molly or there's going to be different body types on SNL, but I see a lot of people who could take their career in a better way if they would empower themselves that way. And that's something that wrestling gave me that I think improv definitely could take from. Yeah. I also think when I started eating right, it just, 
it was my mind was better you know like because because that lifestyle a performer's lifestyle is just so towards getting you in real trouble you know like because it's it's nighttime it's late there's really nothing to do afterwards except hit the bar you're almost always in a bar you know like and so there's like and that and then once a great great conversation happens you don't want it to end so the next thing you know you turn around and it's 3 a.m you're looking for the four car and you know and and like any sense of like living right or eating right or or whatever is is gone man yeah like, the food choice is to eat right at 4 a.m after the you know, bar like you're in the wiener circle or you know or the <laughs> diner grill and you're getting uh you know yeah. <laughs> whatever that was called over there the mess or whatever yeah. uh, garbage you know, plate. you're waking up then you're waking up at noon and you know and starting that starting that same that same cycle cycle again um and it's easy to start feeling worse about yourself, less about yourself. And, you know, and then you're just, you're just on that wheel. You're also in a thing, you're also in a field where like, you're supposed to say yes to everything. So someone puts something in front of you. You're like, I'll try this. I'll try this. Yeah. I'll try this. You, know, like, yeah. you just have to say yes. And I'll spit it out into this napkin afterwards. That's all. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I you're like the guy in the loony bin. Or you're like, <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Um, so out of those three, who's your favorite tag team partner? <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. I looked it up the other day within, I think it was within two weeks. I started the Sonic commercials and started playing with, with Dave. <clears throat> so those two partnerships have lasted now like 17, 17 years. Those two most like professionally impactful Awesome. you know par partnerships um but but also the last two years i was married two years in august is the first time i've had like a you know life partner that like oh this is what it's supposed to to be like there's not supposed to be like a lot of inherent fear and, and uh, yeah. you know fretting and fighting isn't daily fighting isn't necessarily part of, of what it, what it's supposed to look like well it can be a lot more like the you know the creative partnership i have with dave where we just we get along we bounce ideas off of each other you know like if if you disagree it ain't a fight it's just like oh i see things differently than than you on this particular on this particular thing you know like don't get it twisted beth will whoop that ass <laughs> that's why oh, <laughs> now my money's on beth time <laughs> yeah. oh yeah i'm i'm bet i'm gonna have you place the bet so it doesn't seem sketchy Right. For me. <laughs> well, then I'll book the match too, and we can get you to lay down the right way. So you don't get hurt. <laughs> um, yeah, man. Uh, I mean, all those uh, tag partners have been awesome just to watch the progression of each, and, and each in their own individual way has their own draw to them, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the conversation. It's not trying to repeat it uh, the same way with, with, with different people. So I, I really enjoy yeah. that. Well, you, you know what it is, like, also, Ben, is, is that, like, I'm lucky enough – to have partners who draw cool things out of me. I don't know if, I don't know if you ever feel that with like, Oh man, I'm really funny when I'm with this friend, you know, like, and it's not, it's not like that you're doing anything different. It's they, they open up a different part of your head or they open up a different part of your personality that, that you don't necessarily even know how that door opens. But when you're with them, like you remember uh, Pat O'Brien or Michael, Michael Patrick O'Brien, I always felt great talking to him. And I think it was because he drew something out of me that was like, oh man, that, that feels good. That feels good. <laughs> I love the testing in the closet segment. I love that he got his his bit there, dude, and they turned that into so much. It was so good. Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm lucky enough with the with the podcast to have someone like Rush who draws out another different uh, you know, part part of me that's not of my doing, but that is, yeah, is, is I guess that's the way to say it. It's just drawn out by them something they're doing says like, Oh, I can be, I can say this or think this way or be like this. You know? So let's talk about it. Here's the situation podcast available. I'm listening on Spotify, you guys, but I'm sure you can get it on iTunes. I'm not sure where yeah. you guys hope. Is it Podbean or not, but I'm sure Google play music. You guys, uh, here's the situation. Uh, let us know what, what it's all about, man. Well, it's a podcast. We call it a hypothetical, a, a real podcast about hypothetical situations. So it really is kind of like, Two guys bullshitting either dumbly about smart things or smartly about dumb things, I think. Um, and so it's we were both guys who like to wonder. Um, and so, for example, I think in our first episode, which was 
uh, Sense and Census Ability, um, which was about census of the census. Where I looked up that the original census was to, to find out how many um, uh, young men in Rome were of fighting age. So it was basically to, to get raft going for their, you know, for their wars. And so we came up with this situation where like, if you were drafted today, but uh, into a war, but the, but the draft was no longer hooked to time, which American war would you be like, man, I do not want to go to that one. The civil war sounds fucking terrible. <laughs> and which one would you most hope you were being drafted in? And we might talk about something like that for five, 10 minutes and maybe explore a little bit about like why you even make those kind of decisions. Like I don't, me particularly, I don't like guns. So I'm going to the Revolutionary War so that if a dude like two minutes while he's reloading just to take off into the bushes, you know, like by the time he like, rips the back, you know, ting, 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 you know, ball, I'm gone, you know. And also I'm from Massachusetts. That's where a lot of it was. So I, I could go home for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, that that's the easiest war for sure if you're a Yeah. It's the easiest one to coward on and run away from. But I'll tell you what, if he did get a shot on you, it's also the worst for possibly surviving medically. Oh, dude, if I get sick, <laughs> I'm like there's a there's literally a dude with a saw. Bones, <laughs> yeah, dude, the old bone ripper, yeah, for sure. And there might be something like that, which is kind of serious, but then there might be something like uh uh Rush has asked me a couple times he has a situation about like an eBay wizard, my uncle, you know, my no buddy is like an eBay wizard. He's got these spells where like he wants to price them to sell at uh, the buy now price, but he doesn't want to get gypped. So like, what's the what's the right price for a one time jump twenty feet in the air? Like, I don't know, four hundred bucks. Who you know, like, is that that is that the right price or is this like, <laughs> way undervaluing it? And so we might have a serious conversation about the proper price for a one jump spell of 20 you know one time spell of a jump 20 feet um and so we'll 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 try and um never quibble with with the hypothetical we just try and deal with it on its face and hopefully it's interesting someone described it as like overhearing two kind of smart guys talk about dumb shit at a bar and liking that conversation that you're overhearing. So I think it's a fairly accurate description. It definitely has some uh, cheers flavor to it with Norm and Cliffy. Oh, you know what I mean? A little bit of that. <laughs> uh, and, and if you guys, you know, just want some great stuff that is going to make your imagination go and say, well, what would I do in that situation? Yeah. Uh, that's what here's the situation is all about, you guys. And it's just like having some fun talk because as improvisers, we're taught, very much to get back to the play of a child of a mindset. And here we're talking about possibly high level things, whether it's revolutionary war, hypothetically, and where no one's going to get hurt, but we're using our imaginations based on everything we've learned through undergrad or whatever it is in our life right. experience. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun and it's uh, very natural and I I'm enjoying it, man. Uh, when I, when I have to uh, not get too pumped up uh, to lift, uh, usually on cardio days where I got to go the, the distance, I, I enjoy putting that on the list. Yeah. If, if you want to take a, a slow stroll for 52 minutes, we're, we're your guys. <laughs> yeah. I'm on the bike sweating it out laughing, and people are looking over me like, this guy's man, he's losing it for sure. Yeah, so I'm doing some other energy there on that elliptical well, they see me in the back doing muay thai in the corner against the door and stuff because there's no heavy bag and like all the old ladies are freaking You're out man. <laughs> yeah. gotta... and then and then i'm over there on the bike laughing like a psychopath like <laughs> What's going on? Uh, oh man um i don't know if i want to hit you with that well maybe i will I, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting with both barrels loaded for Rachel Mason because I love her. I love her and I, I, I know I can affect change. And you are looked at as kind of, you know, one of the pillars there. You're the in wrestling. We always say the Mount Rushmore of wrestling and everyone names their guys or whatever. But in Chicago comedy, that's just you and Dave. Right there. Top five or whatever. Who's your top five? Who's your Mount? Who's your yeah, Mount Rushmore who's, for wrestlers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, me, me, me and me. Uh, and uh, <laughs> is the heel answer. Uh, <laughs> but you guys are producing something now. And I, I wish it was inspiring more. The only other people that I'm really seeing doing anything are my Fredonia brothers who are out there now? Pete Byrne, uh, they're doing two man Brent, They're doing two man hammer producing videos. I've seen their stuff lately, doing their sketch stuff. As me running my own media platform with podcasts eight days a week, I have 
12 co-hosts working uh, and seven producers Wow! All, all as a free medium. And the only way I pay them is when somebody sponsors us for a month or the Twitch bits come in and I chop it up. So nobody's getting rich or making a living yeah. wage. It's all for labor of love, just like improv was right yeah. here. You have the world's best improvisers in IO in comedy sports, in annoyance, in second city, all sharing the same pool of people that will rotate through to get a full education. Yeah. You have brand new facilities after a burn down at second city and at IO. The fact that they don't have Twitch live stream set up. They just did that whole thing with uh, the history of Chicago theater with everybody that are heavy hitters, right? Yeah. That was there. That show is gone. Yep. Why that's not set up there for a dollar? I would have paid a dollar ninety nine to watch that live. And how many yeah. other people from LA would have paid that? And how many people from uh, Maine who did all the improv stuff there, or North Carolina, or the fact that let's just tune in on Wednesday nights if Carl and the Passions are free. Maybe improv doesn't translate too well to being on camera on stage. Who cares? It's free. But yeah. when it's DJ and Dave, you better goddamn believe Ben Hamin would pay five dollars on a Wednesday night digitally to see that. I don't, point, I don't want your five. I don't want your five. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll you make my hands go. Go. Uh, up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right. You, you, you get it. <laughs> but, but that, I mean, I would even in the fact in the mornings. Why isn't? Why aren't you? Why aren't? Why isn't Kevin Serretta talking baseball, talking sports at Second City? Why don't they have their own podcasts going sixteen hours a day, where every team? has their own thing that they have to come up with because this is the new media realm. And just to go do lessons and get on stage and pat yourself on the back is a very short-sighted and myopic thing. And I think that me being outside of it now is, is giving me a, a far better view of what the potential is. And I can't believe people aren't jumping on this to make money off of our art in this new Wild West digital realm. I hear you, man. I, 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 the, the short answer is, I don't know. When we first, when the new IO opened, Dave and I had one, one theater there called The Mission, and it was going to be our place. And they did at the time, and I think the company since gone under, have camera, like a, a, a camera in the room that would tape every show. And I think it was eventually so that people could get on there, order it, go through, go through the, like the backlog. You could watch all, yeah, you know, you love the late 90s all of their here's all their shows and i forget whether it was going to be a subscription or per watch kind of thing but before before the place ever got to that point this the business the business sunk um mm -hmm. the, this business who was recording recording them all um so I, I i don't know and part of it is i do i do know that like a little bit and you know watching improv recording remotely there is something lost because there is something about being in the room and feeling a little bit of the danger there and the and the not knowing and that's why i've always said like where other other forms like plays need conflict to be written to be written into it with improv the tension is is real and actual by the not knowing of what's going to happen and so you don't need to like insert new conflict the dramatic tension is already in in the room to begin with. And mm. when you're further away from it, some part of that is lost. But as to why we're always behind or for for years and years, why um, IO or Second City has never been able to put up like a decent like sketch TV show when you have all the talent, all, all of the writers. You have all Where the writers who are gonna find every team, every team, if you're gonna be on stage, you have to do one digital short a week. That's enough to do your SCTV conglomerate TV show every single yeah. week. Yeah. And I don't know if you took like a yearbook picture of every year at IO, you'd be like, well, there's three guys who write for Conan. There's four people who are on SNL there. Why are you letting, you know, when go? Mad was on them? Yep. There's the whole, there's the whole cast of whatever route 57 or, you know, at home with Amy. Sears. Here's, there's everybody. Silicon Valley. Here's everybody here. Here's IO in Silicon Valley, everybody. Uh, and, and yep. the thing with coming from OVW, and when WWE bought that, or when left, when he left them, well, Danny Davis, who owned OVW, has a tape library. Uh, and and okay. WWE is making their own network. And who's on his tape library? Yeah. John Cena, Brock Lesnar, Shelton Benjamin, the, the earliest days. He sold the tape library for $2 million. So think about the money Charna has just lost from 
having that being able to say in the early days, look at all these shows that we could have of Thomas Middleditch, of uh, Lauren Lapkus, of, uh, you know, you can go right down the line of everybody. Yeah. So yeah. the the fact that they're still very short-sighted and I, it's it's kind of driving me out. So I've cut a lot of bigger promos and I won't do it on you, Master, because <laughs> there's, there's so many there's so many things that I, I – I'm just like, doesn't it pay me 60 grand? Doesn't I'll it just I can do it? I'll, I'll come back and do it because the Mason's there, the Messing's there. Like, I think, why don't they have a show where they're two? It's for kids and they're two school teachers and it's their thing. Why, why, why doesn't every, why is everybody going to LA when I see Molly Erdman doing this awesome thing with Elizabeth Warren, right? And then I go look at the social media and there's a thousand people following it. Everybody in the history of Second City who's there now should be forced to follow that stuff, to push them to the forefront. There's so much strength in numbers that they are not using, not putting behind their brand to, to get max value. They're not even getting 20% value, in my opinion, right now of what they could be digital realm-wise, man. And preparing it, people because if you're going to- that were such dipshits, Ben, doesn't it, it, doesn't it have backwards? Five, one dude, five bucks. I'll straighten you out, bro. Five, five I bucks. You. I know uh, you, <laughs> but but that's the thing is be, because we the love of the art now, your people in that improv world are inside the bubble, they can't see their value outside. And then I watch them go to New York and LA, and yeah, Joe Canale, wh where's their community? I don't see them having a community anymore, how tight it was when we were, uh, you know, right by Wrigley in the, in the dark and sweaty or, or during the remodel and it's all dusty. Like the, I don't see any of those guys having that anymore. And they love that. I think the community is really difficult to sustain in Los Angeles, Ben. I, I just think it is. It's I, there's go. something about that place that's like lonely and it's tough to get around. You can't walk to see somebody or ride your bike for 20 minutes. Like, you got to get on the 405 and it's 45 minutes later. You're not, you know, you're still not to Los Feliz or, you know, or, or, or whatever. It's just really tough to, to maintain. And IO went under in LA, which I think, you know, was like, it's just, it's just the clubhouse where you can meet. But like, even when IO here moved down to like Kingsbury, yeah. uh, down by North and Clybourne, you just didn't, you couldn't, it wasn't the place you fell into anymore. And it was when it was at Clark and Addison, you, you could be like a half mile away and just like before you knew it, you were that you were in I.O., you know, like literally downstairs, dark, you know, at, at the beginning, like smoky and jazzy feeling. And it it's it this. I don't know. It's it's not the kind of place you just fall into. Like, like, like did we do we take the, did we take the soul and underground out, out of our own thing by trying to step up and polish it? Some things did. Yeah. You know, like Krispy Kreme used to be like, hey, man, if you're ever in South Carolina, look for this place called Krispy Kreme. It ain't that when it's in the airport. You know, it ain't it ain't that when you can get it at LaGuardia or whatever. Um, and also, even just logistically, you remember that old room. If you were in the room, you were watching the show. There was no other place to go. If you, you you'd have to go out in the alley, you know, like and dance, dance with the rats. So but this place like. Every theater's cordoned off, you know, like you have to go through a ticket taker to get into that, into that space to see that thing. So you're hanging out at the bar. So like, you don't know everyone on every team anymore. Cause you, you just, you're not, you're not seeing them. There's four theaters running simultaneously. It's, it's, you know, you're, you're separated off. And so part of the feel goes away and, and in some ways you become a victim of your own success. But I think guys like us will always hearken to the good old days. You know, like if, if, if we were busting rocks, be like, remember when we bust rocks with big hammers? <laughs> now nah, you bust rocks with machines, you know, like, <laughs> I think and an unavoidable aspect of age too to look right. at it as like, those were the days you know right well they've got new and shiny too and mm -hmm. we were when, the, when they paint the back wall they'd be like oh the back wall's painted yeah <laughs> they've got look all it, right. circle. Right. <laughs> right. right and, and, and it flows in the dark so we can see when we're up, when we're up there <laughs> good stuff man and and you know i i will say with the mission theater because I came in at the end, I was so excited for you guys, and uh, I know that didn't end how you you had wanted it to, and I almost felt not responsible because I wasn't there, but I was like, God damn, I wish I was here with my wrestling knowledge to help them promote and use the promoter tricks that I know 
to make this different. I felt like that I, me not being there could have uh, just been a, a little spot to to maybe do something, but you never know. It's it's all. Well, we also like I, I, we also didn't either have access or. And thank you for that. And I don't doubt you could have you could have helped us greatly. We didn't want to dabble in some of like the real revenue streams that would help. We didn't want to run a we didn't want to run a school. And that was and that's where a lot of the income income comes from, whatever improv theater is from class, classes, classes, classes. Yeah. We didn't have the bar and we wanted to pay our performers. And so like we knew it was going to be brutal trying to survive on ticket prices and pay our performers and, you know, and not run a school when we went in. Um, the only, so the only we knew trick, we were up. Against- the only trick I would have had you guys do is flex on the celebrity man and be like every once a week, we're having a paid show. That's a high ticket with a big name person. That's the celebrity to draw the marks in. And that's where you fund the rest of the stuff that, you know, is going to be a loss leader as a shady wrestling promoter. That's the only way I could think of making it work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, they're all marks. That's that's the word. That's the word when you run a con, right? Yeah, well, that's why we're carnies, bro. That's why that's the big. We speak yeah. carny when I say kayfabe or kize fabe or whatever, any any of that stuff, man. We all speak carny. So, yeah. What's the old day. Can you give me ten more minutes? Is we're at an hour right now? Is that is that too much for you, buddy? I appreciate all your time here. Um, and and twenty three juice left on this battery, buddy. You know, <laughs> I, I've got. I, <laughs> oh man, uh, let me see here. We, we covered all that stuff, dude. Um, yeah, the love of, of baseball, obviously. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, the, I'm, I'm doing all, all that now, but that's a, a huge part of uh, where you are sports-wise. I, and the other thing is, too, after this, uh, the next thing I'm dropping the pebble in the pond for is for us to play golf together because I've been working on my golf game for like three years hard. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, that'll make 50 times better than me. <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been doing pretty well, man. <clears throat> But uh, Yankees in the postseason is that uh, is that upsetting you? I know you you're. I heard on here's the situation. You feel good. You got your closure with the Red Sox. Does it still sting a little bit or no? It, yeah, I mean, it always season baseball without without your team in it fucking yeah. blows. You know, <laughs> I, I, and, and like. Ooh. Maybe we lost battery. Maybe maybe we didn't. Uh, let me see if I can add them back in. Doof. Come on. Oh, man. Oh, there you are, buddy. Sorry. We had a, we had a tag on the play. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. Uh, the Yankees, it, it always sucks when your team's not in the in the postseason. That's right where it cut. <laughs> yeah, because I, 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 I'm, you know, I love I love baseball, but I really love the Red Sox. So I'm not going to watch all nine innings of Cards Nationals. You yeah. know, like, I'll, I'll check in and you know and see if it's interesting. But when your team's not there, it's just it's tough. It's tough to watch. But I will I will say this, like, you know, if the only time I ever get bummed about about whatever my life expectancy is going to be is when I measure it in baseball seasons. You know, like oh. if someone's like, "Hey, man, you're only going to get 82 Super Bowls." Like that's plenty of fucking. Happen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need 82 Super Bowl, but if I'm only going to get like 82 baseball seasons, that kind of that kind of bumps me. Well, bumps you, me live, out. you live through your team doing the five P and the Cubs. So, yeah. dude, I mean, that's just awesome closure for a super fan. Absolutely, you know. I balled my eyes out. Balled my eyes out with Total Strangers in 04 at Mullins, a couple doors down from from where I O was, with a shrine set up. Dude, I had uh, I had Red Sox flags. I had baseball cards of all the dudes lined up in their proper positions on the table. I had a little airplane nip bottle running track. We we had it all. We signed said Yawkey Way. Me and my buddy Matt Hicks, uh, we'd, we'd set up a shrine. Carl would give us the big screen at, at Mullins to just like put That's the awesome. whole thing out. Crying people I didn't know saying it's all going to be okay now. That was after the ALCS, dude. That, was, that wasn't that was even the World Series. That was 2004 ALCS. Wow. After uh, Damon, went, Damon went Grand Slam in Game 7 in Yankee Stadium down the line. It was Fucking beautiful. Like, I, I like go 
after rising out of the dirt, just, just like going to heaven. <laughs> Everything was okay, man. Yeah, man, that's great to, to get to, to feel that. And you, that's just, uh, you know, shivers down your spine forever whenever you need it just to go back to that spot. And I, be I, I, baseball, I set up a thing on Sunday where, like, I just put it out on Facebook. Anyone who wants to go over to Horner Park, I got a bag of baseballs. I got three wooden bats. Let's go over there. It is now built to the point where it feels like Field of Dreams every Sunday. 15 yeah. dudes walking out there. We all play, That's just play awesome. ball. We split into three teams of five. So there's always enough in the field. And then we have three part innings. We might have invented a new form of baseball, dude. Um, That's awesome. It's incredible. I love it so much. And two of them are making a documentary about all these punk musicians, because a few musicians, about all these punk musicians and, and people like Steve Albini related to the punk world who just love baseball. Now baseball is like, it's gone. It was like so square. It's now punk because it's so square. It's mm -hmm. like it's it's so unhip that it's hip to like baseball again, I think, you know, like it's just us and 80 year olds who are digging like it. look. <laughs> yeah, like because uh, did you watch the card documentary uh, on Netflix on baseball cards? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I interviewed, uh, I interviewed him, uh, the, the director and the guy who's about, uh, Stu Stone. Uh, he's a promoter uh -huh. in, in Toronto and I've wrestled for him on <laughs> these crazy shows. It was, uh, I'm not, uh, yeah, well, dude, this show was nuts. It was, I wrestled for the, him and the Megan brothers twice. One was at a synagogue for 400 Orthodox Jews who've never seen wrestling before in their life. <laughs> and you come in. Yes. And, and I wrestled Tomer Shalom. Uh, so it's Eric <laughs> the Jew. and we, we, we have the whole match and like, you know, big heat or whatever, like Jimmy mouth of the South hearts there. Virgil's there, oh, you know? Yeah. 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 So like, dude, tickets, tickets are $375 for that show. That's like, it's the richest Jews in Toronto. And, uh, and, wow. and <laughs> so we do the whole thing. I do the drop to hold spot where he's in the corner or in, in, in like my face goes into my partner's crotch and shit. And they're all laughing and da da da. I, I get back on top with some heat. I pull his legs apart. I look up, I go, this is your bris. And I stomp his crotch. <laughs> they all fucking pop huge for that. And then, <laughs> and, and, and then at the end, the, the Jews beat the Arabs, obviously. And, uh, and, and then, uh, and then we go up to do, the the mega powers handshake and dude all of a sudden all these old jews are like boo don't shake his hand like that was the <laughs> most heat of the whole fucking match dude like it was crazy they probably like had an old school like joy buzzer you know it's <laughs> it's real old school. like <laughs> Well, they, then, then at the next show was I've only worked one backyard show and it was this one another three hundred dollar ticket in somebody's. Uh, backyard with all these Jews again. Jake the Snake Roberts is on there with the snake, the Toronto Raptors announcer, Cole Cabana, whatever. I know Cole. Yeah, absolutely, man. He's all yeah. over Chicago. Uh, you know, that and Colt wins the Jewish Israeli title that they came up with that time. So I may face next summer Colt for the Israeli title yeah. in either a synagogue or a backyard <laughs> with a camel and a snake present. <laughs> we'll have this guy pay, pay in Honus Wagner's. <laughs> right he's got them and i know where to flip them at seven <laughs> uh but that that was i thought that was a, a great documentary i was wondering if you had seen that where it kind of shows how they killed baseball cards and you know yeah. i like the canseco stuff in there but the story of his father and him being estranged was was pretty awesome i thought you were you would really enjoy that there's a pretty good older one too about the origins of uh, rotisserie baseball or what became like basically fantasy baseball called trading the Gator. If you ever get to get to watch it, it's about uh, oh. trading Ron Guidry. I think this guy, I think this guy goes to his therapist and he's like, and he, they had been involved in rotisserie baseball. And he's like, what happened? He's like, Oh, I had, I think it was a dream because I had this. No, it was real. It was, uh, you know, I, I just can't sleep. And, and the therapist like, I'm sure it's fine. What happened? He goes, I traded Ron Guidry. And his therapist like, what the fuck did you do? You <laughs> traded the Gator? <laughs> Worst nightmare come to life. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, there hasn't been any super baseball movies after we've had, you know, years and years of them kind of generationally. Um, I, I, I drop a pebble in the pond and I challenge your brilliant mind. If there's anybody who knows what to do yeah dude I, I i haven't seen one and if it's not yeah. cool again that means it's underground 
And that means you, yeah. you can pl- yeah. you can pluck the heartstrings and you can build a movement and you've got obviously all of the talent and foresight and connections to make it happen, my man. I like my baseball movies to really be like heavy about baseball, you know, like give me a lot of freaking baseball. I think one of, one of my favorite underrated, I think baseball straight baseball movies is eight men out. I really like that movie. There's a ton of just pure ass baseball story in that, in that movie. It was not just a framing device, but like, this is what this story is about. The, you know, the 1919 white, white Sox, black Sox. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I think that's your passion, man. When all I'm trying to do now is move my line forward with everything that I love, from comedy to improv to media, conspiracy and politics. And if I can make micro payments doing it, I feel like I'm yeah. living an artistic life fulfilled. You know, so uh, where I am and where you are, talent wise or clout wise, I like to see you drop those pebbles in the pond, man, and and be able to get those pet projects that uh, you would just. Uh, I'm going to say it, knock it out of the park. Fuck it. <laughs> well, you know, it might be about woodworking, man. I'm, I'm out here in the shed breaking all, all the skids and stuff, trying to figure out how to turn things into, into, into wood. So that's, that, that might be, maybe that's what next trying to figure out how to make furniture. I like it. I like the alchemy of that Dave's working on. And uh, I like your craftsmanship too, man. And uh, I just want to say thank you uh, so much for, for everything you've ever taught me and every lesson I've gotten to learn while you were on stage from you, dude. And I just uh, hope for all the best and my best of Beth and uh, all your tag team partners. And you're well beyond anything that I ever, that I ever helped with, dude. You're, you're, you've been, you've been all right since, since the beginning. I don't think I, I might've just gotten in your way, but it's always good to talk to you, pal. That's just because I'm a Syracuse Mark, and so are you. But you're my brother. I love you, man. This is Ha 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 Meme with the one and only TJ Jagodowski. I'll hit you up on text, TJ, after I lose you right here. Yo, law infidels. Ha 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 ha.